3,4-methylene dioxymethylamphetamine. Killer drug, saviour of mankind. None of the above, all of the above. Um, the UK has a particular interest in MDMA. We have 23 years of heavy ecstasy use in this country. 100 million tablets have been consumed every year for the last 23 years. Are we right to talk about MDMA recreationally and MDMA therapeutically? Can we compare the two? Do the morbidity statistics of recreational MDMA have anything whatsoever to do with MDMA when it's used clinically? Is there a future for MDMA psychotherapy? What do we think about the politics of MDMA? What do we think about the classification? What do we think about the use of children using MDMA? What we have here are a collection of experts in the field of MDMA from psychopharmacology to politics to risk management, psychotherapy. We have people who've published varying different reports and some similar reports. What I would really like to do here is to have a stimulating and arousing debate. Um, so what we're going to do is each speaker is going to give five minutes of uh, kind of setting out the stall um, for MDMA in their view. And then we're going to open the floor for questions and hopefully the panel will question one another and you lot will throw questions at the panel. I'm hoping to not have to do very much at all. If it's not rousing or stimulating enough, I'll throw in a few devil's advocate questions myself, but hopefully I won't have to do much. Um, thank you all for coming to this. Uh, I think this kind of debate is long overdue in this country, so let's see where we go. And I will hand over to Val Cohen. Okay, uh, does somebody else who's not got a PowerPoint presentation want to start to give their five minutes? Yeah, I'll do it. What the hell? Okay. I'll stand here. I don't have PowerPoint. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. yes. Happy days. Right, okay. Um, my my three-month-old three son does better PowerPoint than me. That's why I don't have it. My name's John Cole. I'm the head of the Department of Applied Psychology. That's all you really need to know. Um, essentially, I'm going to ask you a question. This is very interactive. If I were a researcher looking into the uh, safety of MDMA and I applied to the government for some money, how many of you, if you were the government, would give me that money? Quick show of hands. <laughs> That's way more than I thought. Okay, if I, if, if I was to ask you, would you give me money to look at the danger of MD, MDMA. How many do you think the government would put their hand in their pockets and give it to me? Dangers of MDMA. Dangers of MDMA. How dangerous is ecstasy? Okay, well, right. The, such is the nature of research that you've reversed what normally happens when I ask that question. <laughs> uh, normally when I ask that question, everyone thinks the government should put its hand in its pocket and pay to demonstrate that ecstasy or MDMA is dangerous. And most people feel that the government should not pay to show that MDMA is safe. However, those amongst you who know anything around the science will realise that the experiments to show safety will be exactly the same. Okay? But what it shows is that there's a financial imperative for us to discuss danger when discussing drugs like MDMA. And this is why I call it the ecstasy paradigm. So therefore, I've not got slides or discussions of research studies simply because I don't think that's relevant. What I think is relevant is our discussion around the narratives of MDMA and related compounds, in that what we really need to discuss is why are we focusing on safety or danger, 
when in reality the experiments are the same. What we're focusing on is our interpretation of them. Okay? And so therefore, that's all I want to leave you with. Simple question, is it the narrative or is it the danger? Thank you. situation is, is it hugely important and so the drug has potential benefits. We've heard how it, it stimulates release of neuropeptide oxytocin, which is the human bonding um, hormone. It's what you know bonds the baby and mother through the breast milk and through the whole process of birth. But there's this debate, as John Cole just um, talked about, has based been based on harms for all sorts of political, economic and other reasons. The harms are in terms of what happens immediately after you have the drug, a few days later, so short term. In the long term, it's been the main debate. And then something that we've been particularly interested in is what happens after you stop. So I want to, I want to challenge what, what the scientific evidence is on these things. Acutely, we've given ecstasy in a horrible old basement room in, um, the in St Mary's Hospital. Uh, people love it, even when you make them come in at nine in the morning, they get huge kind of empathy, they, they really enjoy doing the experiments. We have to turn people down, we get so many volunteers. But, it, you know, just to be fair, the science shows that it does have some impairing effects. It impairs memory acutely. So between, that's a, in this study we gave either ecstasy alone, um, ecstasy plus alcohol, two, two to three units of alcohol, um, alcohol alone or just a double placebo drink and pill. And what you see clearly is that um, ecstasy 45 and 120 minutes after you've taken it does impair your memory. It stops you remembering words. But it also enhances your ability to control your impulses, Dutch study shows this, and to focus your attention. And it speeds up your psychomotor function, but you won't see that in the newspapers, you've only seen memory impairment. A few days after use, we showed a long time ago, you get this kind of midweek dip in mood, a midweek low. But seven days later, that's gone, you're back to normal. So again, it's only a fluctuating thing, which we think kind of coincides with uh, changes to serotonin in the brain. Long term, there's been such rubbish written about this drug, such bad science. This is a paper from um, a very respected D Dutch group who've done the only prospective study of MDC. They took people from coffee shops before they'd used ecstasy and followed them through, did brain imaging, cognitive testing, after some of them started using the drug. Um, I don't know if I've got a pointer, but I've circled, this is a memory test where you're shown a load of words and then you're asked to recognize 30 words. This got published in the highly prestigious journal, Archives of General Psychiatry. Good point. Thank you. Um, and what it shows is the kids who went on to use ecstasy, before they'd used ecstasy, they remembered nearly all of the 30 words. After they'd started using ecstasy, you still reckon their performance was pretty amazing. Yeah? But what they did was to show an impairment. They, they said that in this group, 22% um, of them had actually shown a slight de decline, like one word. Whereas in the group who'd never used ecstasy didn't show that, only 6.7% showed a decline. The authors concluded our data indicated low doses of ecstasy are associated with decreased verbal memory function, which suggests ecstasy induced neurotoxicity. You don't have to be a scientist to realise that is absolutely rubbish. Um, long term, uh, there's an awful lot of very poor uh, neuroimaging studies done in the field. The best one to date is one uh, done in Canada by Stephen Kish. Um, and they did show uh, a reduction in, your, in an, a, a, a 
an index of your brain's serotonin function. Serotonin is, um, is, is an important neurochemical, especially in things like depression. But even though there was a reduction in current users, um, especially in memory areas, hippocampus, and in sort of perceptual areas like the visual cortex, if you look, it's probably too small to see clearly, but the dark dots are ecstasy users and the grey ones aren't. N nothing was abnormal in the ecstasy users. The overlap between the two groups was huge. No abnormality either in terms of memory or brain function in ecstasy users. Um, we, the year before, using the same radioligand as tissues to look at uh, serotonin in brains, found that when people had given up using ecstasy, there was absolutely no difference in their brains compared to people who used similar other drugs or no, no drugs at all. Um, and um, we've also shown, as well as John Lewis has shown, no memory impairment um, a year after people have given up compared to, to, non, to people who use drugs other than ecstasy. And John Halpins similarly showed a paper, paper recently out um, no memory impairment in people who use ecstasy but not um, a load of other drugs like cocaine um, and amphetamine. No withdrawal symptom, syndrome has been identified. Uh, since we've been researching ecstasy, I've never met a single ecstasy addict. Um, the American government leader are paying someone called Linda Kotler enormous grants to go out and show that ecstasy users fit the psychiatric classification for addiction. Um, and the only way she's showed it at all is by finding people over half of whom also use heroin. So completely atypical of the, um, of the ecstasy using population. Right, thank you. That's Okay, right, thanks Ben for inviting me. So, like Val, I've got five minutes, and um, so I'm going to be fairly quick. I'm going to explain how I came to believe that ecstasy is far more damaging than when I first started doing studies. So my first studies were in 93 to 96, largely interview studies, and we got lots of positive subjective reports. Um, and this is when it was called an intactogen. So I published two or three papers during this period, and like many people at the time, I believed it was quite different from many of the other psychoactive substances. It was an intactogen, etc. However, we also found initial reports of problems. We had people who said, They'd taken it, they had bad experiences. One of the people in one of our interviews said they wouldn't touch it again because their experience would be so bad. A few others said they'd had bad experiences, which were quite unlike earlier experiences they had on the drug. And also we saw recovery problems, as Al pointed out in the previous slide. Um, so many of our users reported that they had the, the midweek blues, which has now been um, well replicated. And, um, we looked at that in a number of studies and found more, more problems midweek. So it's certainly a euphoric drug when taken, but it certainly has untold effects in the recovery period. So if you ask me then, in 96, would I recommend it for therapy, I'd be very neutral. I'd say, well, it seems to have a positive profile, but also it seems to have negative effects as well. So the overall profile from 196 would, would have been neutral. Okay, we then found the first study of memory deficits compared with um, young matched uh, non-users. Um, this confirmed an earlier American study, which is more or less a clinical report of nine users who also had psychiatric problems. And this has now been confirmed in published studies. It's probably 30, 40, 50 studies which have found deficits. Um, most of those studies have controlled for other drug use, including cannabis. Rogers took a big government-sponsored meta-analysis in 2009, and they had seven measures which they had sufficient data on, so they were done in eight or nine studies or more, where they could do a meta-analysis. And in seven of the measures, they concluded that ecstasy was more damaging than polydrug user controls. So the control group was crucially other drug users not using ecstasy. 
Well, one measure they didn't find a deficit was NART, which is a measure of intelligence. But the other six measures were all memory measures. So the meta-analysis concluded there were specific memory problems for next to see users. We've also looked at higher cognitive problems, particularly prefrontal problems, and a number of groups have found problems in higher executive deficits, problem solving, social intelligence, um, and again, most studies these days need to control for cannabis in their statistical analysis from the groups. You also find acute tab reactions. One of the intriguing things about ecstasy is the wide variation in individual responses. Some people seem to be very robust, many people have mild problems, and some people have quite severe problems. So we find this in the serotonin syndrome. And again, occasionally people develop quite a strong syndrome and a um, small proportion need um, hospital emergency treatment. So if you treat the medics who work in emergency Saturday night, for the past 10, 15 years, they said they often have stimulant abusers, users, whatever they like to call it, in their hospitals, then almost invariably treated successfully. So people need, now know how to treat the hyperthermic reaction successfully, and most people are, are, are released following, following down something. <coughs> but it is certainly a severe abreaction. The midweek problems we've talked about. Um, with, well, 97, I found the first case of a psychiatric problem. This is a young recreational user reported for phobic anxiety, which they attributed to being um, an ecstasy user. So um, we've ended some studies and we found raised psychiatric problems in lots of ecstasy users. And again, this is compared with other drug users as well. Other users also have problems of cocaine, amphetamine, methamphetamine. They're all associated with psychiatric distress. MGMA is, is not dissimilar from those. So 2006, I just said no, it wasn't a safe drug. More recently, I've been looking at the effect of environmental cofactors, and these seem to exacerbate the problems. So if you look at dancing, music, psychosocial factors, the theory is it's not just the drug alone, it's the concomitant stimulation with these to the brain being overstimulated, and this leads to a positive on-drug experience, but it also leads to a negative recovery problems in the week afterwards. So we found people that dance the most report the strongest <laughs> midweek recovery when matched for drug use. So it's a combination of drug and physical overstimulation, which seems to be a problem. Firm, I'm writing a review of us on, on the moment, and at low doses, MGMA has very minimal effects on temperature. Just, okay. Firm effects there. Um, visual defects, several groups have now reported subtle deficits in the occipital cortex. Um, social intelligence, which I think is relevant to MDMA as a therapy, this seems to be reduced in regular users. Neurotoxicity, the Kishinel paper, um, Balcar and said the, the, the effects weren't particularly marked, but it's a big overlap. I'll talk about one area, the insular cortex, 51% of the ecstasy user group had certain levels below the lowest region of the control group. So there was a lack of overlap. Many of the ecstasy users had quite strong deficits. So in conclusion, I wouldn't recommend it. I wrote a review on therapy in 2007. Okay, let's, uh, let's stop there. Okay. We can bring in some of this later, is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you.
we are desperately in need of ways of enhancing psychotherapy. Uh, Lorena, the grand, grandfather of uh, psychedelic therapy in Europe, once made the approximation that only 50% of people can be treated by psychotherapy. So we need something that is an enhancer. And from my point of view, what I have seen, MDMA can be this drug, can be one of the drugs. And I strongly advocate to differentiate between uh, the therapeutic use, where you would administer one dose of 125 milligrams in a completely different setting, no physical exercise. Um, it has been shown that, uh, for example, the cortisol levels, uh, when exercising, they go way up, and if you are lying on, on the couch, they are lower, much lower. Maybe that's one explanation for the damage that uh, is, uh, could, it could cause. We should investigate. We have a chance now, with these studies going on, to combine these studies with neurophysiological uh, studies. That would be really uh, interesting and supports evidence of damage or benefits. Hello. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I do have a stopwatch. <laughs> I'll see if it works. Um, well, first off, I would like to thank Andy Parrott and all the other researchers that have looked at the risks of MDMA and of ecstasy. I think it's essential that we have a clear understanding of what the risks are. However, I think it's been the case that the risk data has been exaggerated and the potential of benefits has been denied. And so whenever you're doing a risk-benefit analysis, if there are any risks and there are no benefits, then you would conclude that it's not appropriate to use the drug. But it's been, if you look at Medline right now and you put in ecstasy or MDMA, there's over 3,500 papers that have been published at a cost of over $300 million. There's only one paper on a completed study of the therapeutic benefits of MDMA, and that's Michael Minhofer's study. So that paper, though, has fundamentally shown that there are benefits. And I think Andy's data that he talked to us about, about how he's now convinced that MDMA is unsafe for therapeutic use, it all comes from recreational use of MDMA. So I think it's a completely inappropriate, although it's valuable, but it's not enough. We need to look really at the risks in a therapeutic context, and we don't see the kind of risks that he's talking about. But even if we did, you know, aspirin kills a lot of people. People are allergic to penicillin. We don't have to show, or we don't have to claim that MDMA is this rare drug that has no risks and only benefits. And the temptation, in a way, is for advocates to be boxed into that corner because the other side is saying there are all risks and no benefits. But what we're really looking for is an accurate comparison of risks and benefits and then a weighing of them from actual research and therapeutic contexts. And so I have seen over the years that the risk data has been used to suppress research into benefits. From 85, when MDMA was criminalized, to 92, when the FDA opened the door to MDMA research, seven years went by, no possibility of permission to do MDMA research into therapeutic uses. That has now changed. Um, Andy spoke about the first study of the neurocognitive consequences in nine subjects. That study was funded by MAPS. What you don't probably realize, that was done by Larry Price and George Riccardi, it was done at Yale. MAPS, we are trying to be the leaders of the research into the risks of MDMA when used in a therapeutic context and also the benefits. That particular study was done, I, I paid for the neuropsychologist to do the analysis. Uh, Riccardi was doing other measures, the treatment challenge tests, things like that. And I got this report from the neuropsychologist and it said there's nothing here remarkable. There's a few changes, but it could easily be attributed to the fact that Several of the subjects flew in from California, that they had just received tryptophan and the tryptophan challenge test, they're unusually intelligent, there's nothing here. And to my surprise, years later, this turned into a paper with John Crystal and the neuropsychologist as co-authors. 
And I called the neuropsychologist and I said, how could you do this? I don't understand the difference between the report that you gave me and the paper that was published. And he said, if you ever release the report I gave you, I'm going to sue you. <laughs> and I was like, this is my property, I pay for it, how can you possibly do that? But you can see that there is a tendency to exaggerate the risks in order to get publications. So I think that the risk research is absolutely essential, but I think it's been highly biased by uh, motivations coming from funders to justify uh, cruel and counterproductive prohibition. And I think that the potential patients who could be benefiting from this is a major social cost that usually is not uh, weighed into any of these discussions. So what I'd just now like to switch and just say that we have a series of phase two pilot studies all over the world, and we're looking at a range of methodological questions that we need to address. And what we're gonna try to do is find out over the next two to three years, uh, what is our method? How do we refine the method? How do we teach the method? How do we assure ourselves that therapists in different settings are actually adhering to the method? How do we develop a double-blind study with a powerful psychoactive drug like MDMA? Are there cultural differences, and how do we figure out what they are and how to work around them? Um, is the cause of PTSD requiring a different treatment? Or can we enroll people that are uh, victims of sexual assault and also combat-related PTSD and also car accidents? And our working assumption is that the cause of the PTSD is irrelevant. So then we go to the FDA and we say, uh, here's our data, and we propose a phase three study. And if they accept the design and permit us to go forward, then we move forward with that. And it'll probably take us three years to get to the end of phase two meeting, another five years, to, and another eight or nine million dollars to get to uh, the end of the phase three. Then we submit it to FDA, and I'm anticipating that in a decade, um, if we're fortunate, we will probably have MDMA as a prescription medicine. Thank you. Um, well, okay, I, I want to just ask, are, in the audience, do we have any psychiatrists, sci uh, clinical psychologists, or other people who work clinically with patients? Or, sorry, clients, probably. Right, um, I'm interested to know um, whether or not people have come across uh, morbidity associated with um, recreational ecstasy use uh, in their clinical practice. Uh, no, I haven't either. Um, who is that? Yes, uh, would you like to tell us about that? Sorry, could you repeat that? I sometimes go walked out of the using it fairly extensively, but nothing that can't be corrected with amino acid supplements. Okay. <laughs> so, so you're describing a, a mild adverse effect. Um, my question was really whether clinicians have found uh, clinically relevant um, mental disorders um, associated. So, uh, thank you for that, um, because we are aware that it does have mild subjective effect, um, negative effects in people. Um, but the point I was making was, are these subclinical, or are these at a level that are reaching the psychiatric clinics and um, hospital beds? And uh, my broad experience, and speaking to other psychiatrists, is they're not at of a clinical level. So uh, I just wanted to make that point. Well, I didn't Someone else. tend to uh, disagree with you, Ben, but <laughs> um, I, I am aware of someone who um, had taken MDMA and under the influence of MDMA had remembered a prior sexual assault, which had led to physical violence and she almost had been killed. 
And under the influence of MDMA, it came up, but she wasn't in a context where she felt she could really work it through. And so she ended up checking herself into the emergency room and the hospital to avoid committing suicide. Later, she contacted me. This was in 1984. And I agreed to sit with her with another MDMA experience. And it ended up helping her to confront it in a safer context. And then from that, she decided she wanted to become a therapist. She now is a therapist, and she's worked on our Spain MDMA PTSD study. So that's something that's now um, you know, 26 years ago, and, and she's had long-term positive benefits. So I think the context of MDMA is absolutely critical. It's possible to take MDMA in a setting where you end up feeling worse off sometimes for months. And so my question for Andy is, how, how can you really, in all good conscience, look at the risk data from non-medical, non-clinical settings and say that, that justifies a decision that MDMA research in clinical settings is too dangerous to conduct? Well, you, you described one study from uh, 1984, right? If you look at the Graham Tolbert paper published in 1986, they had 29 clients. Now, these weren't psychiatric clients. They were friends and acquaintances, about nine of whom had sort of psychiatric levels of, of problem, but they weren't psychiatric clients. Now, two of those 29 had abractions to the drug, which lasted more than a week. Many, many of the participants had had aberrations that lasted a few, a day or so. But these two had problems which lasted um, a few weeks. Yeah, and so and would you be... Um, so if, even with one... Okay, I'm saying... Very you be, administration, you can elicit, you can engender problems. Yeah, yeah. So would you be influenced if I were to speak to George and Rico and say, find out how those two people are doing right now? If we could get that information what it, and give it to you, would that in any way change your attitude about the therapeutic research with MDMA? Well, they actually described this in the paper. And one of the clients got better after a few weeks. The other was given free non-drug assisted psychotherapy for a year. So the problems of that 29th person were really quite enduring. And so they needed a fairly prolonged period of therapy after one session. The problem with MDMA is it elicits all sorts of material, both positive and negative. Uh, Franz Vollenweider has shown this, lots of other groups have. I've been involved in a study in Australia where we, we tested people in a, in a boring laboratory where people had to drive simulated cars, and we didn't get positive moves. And it's probably because the environment wasn't positive. In other words, what happens with MDMA is it boosts all material. It's a CNS stimulant. And if you're in the wrong environment, you may well have negative material boosted. Yeah. So in my final slide, I was going to say the crucial factor is the therapy, not the drug. Yes. And in fact, yes. Gruen Tolbert said the primary thing is the therapy. So my position is it's far safer just to give therapy. Because... <laughs> well, can, can, we, can, can Val, Val cut yes. in here? Sorry, I just don't understand how you get different results from everyone else, Andy. If you look across all these, if you look across all the studies, I mean, Kim Kuyper and Ramakas, the Dutch people, they've done lots. We've done stuff. Uh, Harriet DeWitt's done it. Everybody gets these really positive moods. And as, as I said, we, did our, we do our studies in a basement of a hospital. It's not at all a nice environment. And I, I think there's something odd about your data, that no one else gets it but you. And I also think that in your chat with, um, with Rick Doblin, you're talk, if you take any drug, there's always going to be one or two or a few people who have a bad reaction, even alcohol. Um, you know, it's not... Um, the, the mood data we're most surprised at. We expected to get positive effects, so we were very surprised when we didn't. As you say, Are you sure it was ecstasy. You go. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was provided from a Swiss pharmaceutical firm, so I, I guess Swiss are pretty high high quality. So, um, so it was 100 milligrams of um, laboratory MDMA. If you mentioned Harriet DeWitt, she and Jolinda Beddy in New York have published two studies where they didn't get positive effects. And in both those studies, the participants were given other tests in the laboratory. And I, what we wrote about in the, in the paper was the environment. If it's in a negative laboratory environment where you're having to do lots of tasks and everything, MGMA probably won't give you a positive experience. 
If you're experiential, sitting in an armchair, you've got supporting people around you, encouraging, you'll get a nice positive experience. Well, so it's the environment. Agree, agree to differ, because we, we do eight hour studies, they come at eight in the morning and we keep them all the way through and, and you, on, on, on the MDMA days, they love it. <laughs> John. Yeah, I've got a, a slightly different take. If we look at all of the neurotoxicity studies, we look at the brain imaging studies, the studies where tryptophan has been administered, if you look in the, in the participant section, it clearly says none of these people had a psychiatric problem. Okay? So in all of the studies that have been quoted around whether they've got uh, neurotoxicity or not, none of them had a psychiatric problem. So how do we get this notion that all of the psychiatric problems observed in people are due to MDMA and are due to neurotoxicity? Because people who are clearly demonstrated, according to the papers, to have neurotoxicity don't have any psychiatric problems. And I've reviewed plenty of these papers as a scientist. And one of the things that I didn't want to say because it's potentially libelous and there's a camera pointing at me, <laughs> is part of the problem we have is that when challenged, the authors refused to draw the attention of the reader to that fact. I did it in every review and every time when the paper was published, it was not there. And I think that what we've got to accept is that whilst there's a large amount of research, as Val has pointed out, a lot of it's done very poorly, but there's also a huge publication bias, and we have to take that into account when we consider that research. So. Okay, uh, can we have a question? Uh, Robert. Well, this isn't a question so much as a brief uh, account. From, from 1981 until 1985, I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, and I had embarked upon a quasi-formal investigation of MDMA, where I had handed it out to uh, hundreds of people, me and my associates, this is how Rick actually got his first MDMA. When I had, when I had collected, when I had collected uh, over a hundred uh, written reports of this experience, I took it to Daniel X. Friedman, who was the president of the American Psychiatric Association and editor of the Archives of General Psychiatry, and I said, this is a new drug that hardly anyone knows about that is extraordinary and it may be the best thing that psychiatry has ever had. He referred me to Dr. Charles Schuster, who at the time was the director of the University of Chicago Drug Abuse Research Unit. And I gave him and his lab assistant some. And, and then um, in 1985, I was about to give a lecture at the University of Chicago on the curative effect of MDMA. This was the morning that the DEA declared their emergency scheduling of the drug and Dr. Schuster and Dr. Seiden were, were written up in the Chicago Tribune as the experts on MDMA that said it caused this brain damage, this damage to serotonergic receptors. I was astonished because just two weeks earlier, Schuster was supporting my formalizing my research at the University of Chicago. So I went to his office and I said, what is, how, how could you do this? This is just what happened with LSD. A rumor is introduced and now there are still people that think that LSD causes brain damage. He took me into his office and he explained to me, and this is exactly what he said. He said, he said look, he said, I have a nice setup here. He had a whole floor of, hosp of the Billings Hospital at University of Chicago. He said, the government gives me a lot of money. Sometimes I just have to do what they say. Two years later, Dr. Schuster was appointed to head NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse. I think the story indicates that there is a, a kind of crisis of legitimacy in this whole MDMA debate from the very beginning, that this brain damage stuff is kind of contrived and misleading to justify a political position of the government, in this case, in the US.
consistency in the removal of brain of course, and that's part of the reason why we can argue from here to eternity about if it's toxic or not, because it's not possible to, to, to show it, it's not possible to come with an investment to really show it. The closest might be that uh, America might be the system of the animal, it's definitely a good uh, attempt to try to show uh, a look at it, it's definitely relevant. And uh, in, a, in a paper that we will publish in, in it will be published in two months. We have also measured the uh, performing plant oil. And it can be, some people view it as a marker of toxicity. We don't necessarily do that because it could also just be an effect of a state of serotonin depletion if, if this serotonin plant oil be downregulated. But what I think is important to say is that uh, one thing that we see and also a third study that has not come out yet from, from a New York group. We see the same thing as the Kish people. We see a quite severe decrease in serotonin transporter binding in the cortex, especially in occipital cortex. And it's not necessarily reversible from, from the data that we have, and also the same is seen in this New York group. So the, it's, the jury is still out to see if there is actually severe in, in heavy users. Heavy recreational uses of ecstasy if there is um, changes in the serotonin system or not. It actually Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can I can no. I reply to that? Yes, please. Um, in the Kish study, they found variation in the reduction of the serotonin transporter. But what they also found is it correlated with two things. One was cumulative lifetime dosage. So the heavier users had less of the transporter. The second thing they correlated it with was the memory impairment. So the loss of the serotonin transporter was correlated with poorer yeah. um, performance on their, on their cognitive tasks. I know, and, and, and we, we actually see the same. We also see an effect. So the, the more lifetime uh, use of ecstasy, the lower the serotonin transporter. So we see the same. The New York group see the same. So there's some kind of lifetime dose response relationship. But what we also see, and what the Kish paper that you just referred to, and you actually didn't mention that because that might be as important, is that they see also a relationship, and we see that time since last use and the binding. And that points to a pos possible reversibility of the binding so that the serotonin transporter might be downregulated, but it might get back up if you uh, take a break and don't use ecstasy. And in our data that will come out, we, we, it looks like 200 days of afternoon from the serotonin transporters back in business, especially in, in soft portal regions. We don't see that in cortex. Can we just be very clear, actually? Sorry to interrupt. Ecstasy and MDMA are not the same thing. Please, I do a lot of court work for dealers. What's the difference, please? The difference is ecstasy is an illegal drug in tablet form that very rarely contains MDMA. Most street ecstasy in the UK at the moment contains benzyl piperazines such as trichloropiperazine or metachloropiperazine. It does not contain 3 4 methylene deoxymethamphetamine. Um, I can point at Simon up there, it's embarrassing. But we recently did the uh, amnesty bins from Creamfields. There wasn't much MDMA apart from in crystallised form. So, Let's just be clear, ecstasy is a street drug which may or may not contain MDMA. Therefore, we cannot say using it 500 times equates with exposure to a known dose of MDMA. That is just nonsense. Right. When we're discussing MDMA... <laughs> Data. But I think, our, I mean, Kish quotes our study um, where we looked at people who'd given up ecstasy for at least a year. That was an inclusion criteria. And, and we found no differences whatsoever. And, then, and I think the other interesting thing about, about Kish is he found no differences in the striatum, which is where you'd expect the differences yeah. to be. But I think, I think we all agree it's the time since last use. Yeah. Brenneman's data agrees as well. I think eight of the nine studies that have looked at people reducing or stopping do show um, an association between recovery of cert and time since last use. And certainly, I mean, our study took two years to, do, to find the right controls. We couldn't find British people who'd used stimulants and other things the ecstasy users had used. There weren't anyone in Britain. If, if you'd used ecstasy, you'd also use or whatever else. 
So we ended up getting volunteers from South Africa, from Australia and New Zealand, because they, you know, the ecstasy movement has started later there. But I think it's really important how your controls are matched. And, it, and you're saying about heavy users showing non-reversibility. I would worry about the effects of lots of other drugs on CERT. I don't know how heavy users are going to be using lots of other things heavily as well. Um, can I okay. add one? Okay. Okay. We might come back to you in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to make just one point too, is that the real issue I think is functional consequences. And that's where I think you, the, the assumption is if there's a change, somehow or other that's bad. And we're already talking about, and Peter talked about it, how there are changes associated with therapeutic benefits. So first off, this assumption that any kind of change is bad. And then there's just this, um, focus in our particular study, we did neurocognitive tests with people who got three doses of MDMA, 125 milligrams plus 62 and a half after two hours, and there was a, a slight gain in neurocognitive performance after the MDMA treatment, which is not to be unexpected because people's emotional issues, their anxiety, depression, PTSD affects their performance on neurocognitive tests. So if we can help people with their PTSD, we would assume that their neurocognitive performance would go up. Now, the placebo people who also had a 20-point drop in their caps, not as much as the MDMA people, they got better as well, slightly, in their neurocognitive. So I think the key point is, what are the functional consequences? And I, I would just like to remind, I don't know how many people have recently heard that it was about six months ago, George Riccardi and Una McCann just came out with a new paper saying that MDMA causes potentially fatal sleep apnea. <laughs> that was in the title, potentially fatal sleep apnea. And it just doesn't get the press that it did anymore, that it, did, that it used to. You know, there's just this exhaustion in a way with the effort to try to show that MDMA has these fatal consequences. And then how does it back down to a few doses in therapy? And that's why I say again to Andy that we really need to look at risks in a therapeutic context. And we are doing our best to study neurocognitive performance. We're, we're not, we're going to start doing some sleep measures. We don't really believe there's potentially fatal sleep apnea from MDMA. But I think we need to really look at pure MDMA in a therapeutic context and then evaluate it in a comprehensive way. If I could just one comment raised to the thing. Serotonin is important to breathing. So when you breathe at night, that's controlled by serotonin. So if you're an MDMA user, you're damaging your serotonin <coughs> system. That's what Record and McCann reported. But you had young, fit people who weren't overweight. Sleep apnea is normally associated with male, males who are overweight. And it's a disorder where you stop breathing in the night. And what was happening with the young, youngsters in their mid-twenties who weren't overweight, and about, was it 25% of their sample, had sleep apnea. So how so many have died then, Andy? Surely if, I, if I we've got millions of exercise users and sleep apnea, about. surely we should have a fatality count in the thousands. Yeah, um, sorry, does, does anyone else I'm, see the logic of the fact that there's I'm no not, dead people? I'm not defending the time, I'm just yeah. trying to talk about it. Where are the dead people? It's, um, it's a nonsense, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to ask a question about um, the, the way in which neurocognitive testing is carried out. Um, can the panel enlighten me? Um, how many of these uh, studies that demonstrate neurocognitive, uh, neurocognitive deficits um, include um, urine drug testing on the day of the test? Um, uh, because, of course, nobody's disputing that acutely intoxicated with MDMA. Um, one can be somewhat disturbed neurocognitively, that is, after all, why people take it. Uh, one man's new, neurocognitive cognitive deficit is another man's party. <laughs> so, so, if you're going to bring someone into a laboratory and do neurocognitive testing on them and they're ecstasy users, and we've already asked the question, whatever the hell an ecstasy user is, because we don't even know what ecstasy is. Um, how well, um, have we got some good studies that really control on the day of testing for um, any con com 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 competent drug use? Um, well, yeah, I think both our group and John Royce's group, um, the latest studies um, did use, we used hair as well as um, urine so that we could see what previous drug, your hair is like, was like a tree, you can see each centimetre of hair grows um, in a month and you can see, you look at drug use in your hair. Um, and in those studies, we, we found no difference between poly drug users and ecstasy users in neurocognitive function. 
So the better control studies, I think, uh, Andy will probably disagree, um, show a lack of difference, really. So when it's well controlled for, you don't see the neurocognitive deficits? Um, that's, my, that's my take on it. And when, it's, when they're better studies, they're bigger studies, they're, they're better matched for other drug use, then you know, I think uh, you, you don't see it. You're probably not going to be surprised by that. The KISH study, they took hair samples and they proved that they were MDMA users, so MDMA was present there. They also took urine samples to control for recent drug use. So it's a, the, the KISH study is really, if you want to see a good paper, um, many of the early papers were flawed. It's an extremely difficult area to do research in. There are lots of potential confounds. But the KISH study, I, I think many people as Val said it, is now seen as pretty much a gold standard. The Buckup group in America, Elizabeth Raymond's group in Holland, have done lots of very good research, but the KISH was quite remarkable in the number of things they tried to control, and they did find memory deficits. Um, can, I, can we take a question from the floor? Is that okay? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Given that we're noticing that there's some seeming depletion of serotonergic transporters, have we considered other means of increasing that? I've recently come across the study of the UDV members that uh, Jace Calloway, Dennis McKenna, uh, I think the Salado Luna was part of it as well, where they, they found that they were more psychologically integrated, but I believe they also found that they had more serotonergic receptor sites developed in the brain, and I believe that's to do with the Banisteriopsis capi, the mal inhibited function, rather than the psychiatry of Viridis. So is there any work being done on to how you might address the problem of serotonergic... Well, I'll just say that in our clinical study, we have explicitly decided not to try to co-administer any other substances with MDMA because we want to try to get a complete picture of what MDMA does by itself. So we think it's way premature to conclude that in a therapeutic setting, there is some neurotoxic problem at all anyway. And then to try to do multiple drugs administered at the same time is just really too complicated and not necessary. So we have not seen the need to do that in clinical studies. Uh, yeah. So um, I would like to introduce uh, a study which was done kind of 10 years ago uh, by Tomasius et al. And it was a government finance study and uh, I only want to give a short introduction. It was five groups uh, doing, uh, five, they have done five groups. One uh, without any drug use, one with the usual drug use but without ecstasy and three ecstasy using groups. One was 50 to 100 doses, one was 100 to 500 doses and one was 500 to two, two and a half thousand doses, but with other drugs used, similar. I mean, at the same point of time, which is different from Halpern's new study. And this study was showing that the group with the lowest range of cumulative dosage of ecstasy use haven't had any deficiency in every, any parameter, and they have done a very thorough study with even PET scans and neuropsychological batteries and everything. And the funny thing is that this, uh, uh, the results of this study were published as a book because it was an end report of a government finance study. So, but the publications which came out afterwards in the international literature in the English language, they were putting all the ecstasy using groups together so that under the line everybody got a damage. And not so much people are aware of that study, but I guess Mr. Paris, as a spe specialist, should be aware of that. And what does he think about the low range ecstasy using group and about these results, even with other drugs used at the same point of time at rave parties, etc.? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm aware of the published journal papers. Yeah. I wasn't aware of it, it was a chapter in the book. Okay, okay. So, so this is the thing, how they fitted it together. So at one conference, I may mention that for a second. I'd like to see the... Yeah, yeah you, I can show you. If you could email or send yeah. it to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's done in a book. And the funny thing is, when Mr. Tomasius was presenting his results at the scientific conference, I was putting my finger up and asking him, what's about that group? And he told the people, yes, you're right. They hadn't had any deficiency. But I don't want to mention that because I get funny questions then. <laughs> yes. so, um, some recreational ecstasy users claim that taking 5 HTP day after can uh, delay the midweek blues. Does anyone on the panel know anything about 5 HTP and its effects with ecstasy? No? We've experienced it at work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Secondary. Any scientific backgrounds? <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> have you looked yeah. at the uh, come down effects? Um, I know you differentiated between MDMA and ecstasy, but um, obviously you're talking about a drug which, which you claim gives a happy sensation irrespective of context, which everybody associates with, you know, in my experience, people have associated with very severe downhill feelings that, that you know, afterwards, once the effects are worn off, as a prescription for people with psychiatric disorders. Um, how would you justify that? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I, I wonder whether Peter might be able to come on back on this, because have you, uh, <laughs> um, as I understand it, the question really is, um, can we justify the use of MDMA when there are these anecdotal experiences of negative come down effects when, when used recreationally? Is that right? Um, yeah, this is just speculatively. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, in a therapeutic setting, people are instructed about uh, possible come down effects. And if they are, they take it more easily and they can access help if they need it. And people in recreation settings, as, my, uh, as what I see, often do not know about this. And they are now very well educated about possible um, negative effects of, such as uh, anxiety or stress mood or negative the crisis because some subconscious material comes up. So there is definitely also a need of uh, more education. About so you say education is the reason. So if people are educated enough about drugs, they'd realise that MDMA isn't dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> It's all about um, mindset, set, and setting. And uh, you can, uh, you can, um, sorry. So it's the same, it's the same thing. It's the same with an alcoholic drink, for instance. Yeah. Well, I, I just think that in our um, therapeutic context, first off, that is not a substantial issue. But secondly, the way in which we conduct the studies is that the people take the MDMA in the morning. They don't take it at night. So they, first off, don't lose any sleep. They spend the night in the treatment center, and then they have non-drug integrated psychotherapy the next morning. And then we release them to go home, and then they're called every day for a week on the phone to check in to see how they're doing. And then they come back for non-drug psychotherapy on a weekly basis before their next MDMA session, three to five weeks afterwards. And then we repeat that two or three times, depending on our different studies. And so there are some times when people have opened up such painful emotional material that they're struggling to deal with it for a period of time. And it's not the idea that that is somehow or other such a problem that the therapy shouldn't be done. Um, so. Uh, first a comment and then a question to Andy. Uh, my comment is I'm feeling so horribly naive and upset about this publication bias, publication suppression business. I mean, I feel naive because I didn't really believe it, but you've told me enough stories here. It bothers me very much, not just in the context of drugs, but in the context that in, in other ways I'm always defending science against people who say, oh, no, the science just making it up, you know. I mean, the potential harm of this is not just to drug legalization, to a, a better world in terms of drugs, but to the whole respect for science in general. And that really bothers me. Anyway, I'm going to go home and digest this and worry about it and talk to it. Um, my question to Andy concerns, it's a very small point, but it concerns this business about the cofactors of dancing and so on. Um, you concluded that the people who dance more or do various other things more have worse effects. But I'm, am I right in assuming this wasn't a real experiment? I mean, in a real experiment, you take 100 users and you tell this many to dance this much and this many to dance this much. Presumably, you're asking them after the fact how much they dance. And they could be different people or they could be induced to dance more because of things going on in their brain. The, the cause and effect could be the other way around. So I well, wonder if you could just explain okay, what happened. Well, we've done a few studies. I describe one of them. We've got to let next to see users who the brief go clubbing to the normal club. Next to see users are at the available. Okay, I'll advise that as well. Um, there are ecstasy users, and they agree to go dance clubbing in the same venue, the same group of friends, on two different occasions. On one, they take drugs as normal. We weren't allowed to say take ecstasy, but 
would make the ethics committee allowed to say to take the normal, whatever it was. On the other, they agreed to abstain from ecstasy or any other stimulants. So they didn't take any stimulants. We also took saliva samples, and the saliva confirmed MDMA presence in all 11 people when they danced on MDMA. It confirmed their abstinence abstinence when they danced in the same weekend, same group of friends, off drug. Um, so we have tested this. And um, we've also tested surveys, internet surveys of people and asked them how much they danced, etc. And that's where the data comes on the more memory problems. So those support they dance more, support more problems. Yeah, that, that's exactly my point. It's they reported they danced more. Now, why does dancing more have, have a greater effect. It could be because it's the dancing, but it could be that they're caused to dance more. You, you can only make that conclusion if you've actually manipulated this as an experimental variable, can't you? If I can reply again, I'll reply to you again. If I can reply to you, they also had risk games which are called active graphs. Yeah. So it was recorded by a physical activity. And they had the same similar level of physical activity dancing. They danced on both occasions. We also made a cortisol, and the cortisol increased when they're abstinent, it was, was very little. On the, when they're on empty made, the cortisol increase was 800%, which is massive. They also got zero change in testosterone, whereas they got a 75% in testosterone when they danced on ecstasy. So it's, it's not dancing per se, it's the combination of dancing and the exercise, we, I'm sorry, the dancing and the MDMA, which is probably they, they tested and they found there was MDMA. They tested their samples, the slide samples, and all of them had MDMA. Did you test all the other Alcohol. alcohol kills around 4,000 people through direct intoxication per year. And how many of us would consider going down the pub after this talk to be safe? Okay, so the question is, is the danger always lies, basic principle of toxicology, it's in the dose. So whenever somebody comes to me and says, is XC dangerous, I just go, what are you talking about? The thing is, is it's the dose of MDMA which may potentially cause an adverse reaction. If we look at the medical statistics on adverse reactions, for drugs like MDMA, the overwhelming majority walk in to an A&E and they walk out again. Okay? Usually the people who come in on a gurney and die are the ones who are polydrug users. Okay? So when we talk about the safety of MDMA in a clinical setting, there is data for, <coughs> dating back to when Rick started, to when Franz Vollenweider did his studies, all the way through to when Andy did his study in Australia. No one's died, okay? So the key thing, that, the question that you're asking is, in the correct setting, with the correct dose, is MDMA safe? Well, the fact no one's died, now you could say, well, okay, that's not an indication of safety. 100,000 people per annum die from doctor-administrated drugs, okay? <laughs> so we know that prescribed pharmaceuticals are incredibly dangerous, okay? We also know the pharma uh, sorry, I'm being taped. Uh, we also know about the issues in the pharmaceutical industry. That's a matter of public record in terms of class action suits, suppression of data, etc. Sorry to just upset you yeah, even yeah, more. Answer, yeah. So the key thing is, is the question that you're asking is, is, is very, very difficult to answer. The, the question is whether it's relatively safe compared to the other things that you could do. Okay, so if we, so for example, if we were to use Dave Nutt's example of horse riding or going up into Everest, lots of people do it and lots of people die, but we don't sit around having debates like we're having now. So. Well, I, I looked into this, and, and basically, squaddies on route marches die of hypothermia. Okay, they fall over, form the hypothermia, they die on the spot. 
Okay, the incidence is roughly equivalent to the incidence you see in the uh, ecstasy users. What's the link? Extended aerobic ex exercise, probably with poor um, hydration, probably reasonable nutrition. Similarly, if you look at the serotonin function of marathon runners, it's roughly equivalent to that of ecstasy users. And again, what's the link? Extended aerobic exercise. So the thing is, is if you sit around having a good time listening to classical music, why would you die? There's, a, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's enough studies indicating the physiology of MDMA in those environments. And, and I think that if you look, for example, at the temperature rise of all of the clinical studies, most of them indicate a temperature rise of 0.5 degrees centigrade. If you look at animals, almost invariably you're looking at a, point, uh, sorry, a 2 degree rise, <coughs> centigrade rise in core temperature. And the difference is, they've got fur, we haven't. Okay? We're much more tolerant to the heat stress produced by this combat. So, it, it's got to be the setting. And if you jump up, if you're going like an idiot for eight hours, what do you expect? Okay, I'd like to take a question. Okay, and this, we were, this lady here, and then this chap at the What I, I just want to say is, John, you know, basically raised the question, how many people have died in clinical settings? But there's another measure, which is called the serious adverse event. And all of the regulatory agencies in the world require the researchers to report if there's a serious adverse event. That could be going to the hospital because blood pressure is increased and they needed some special treatment or some psychological problem lasted for over a few days and they had to be hospitalized. There has never been a single seri serious adverse event in over 475 people who have used MDMA in clinical settings. So that isn't to say that it's perfectly safe. And I think what we have to constantly get back to is balancing risks and benefits. And I think that's what has been suppressed for so long. There is only a tiny nonprofit. We have a budget of a little bit over a million dollars a year. We're the only people in the world paying for studies into the therapeutic use of MDMA. That's fundamentally wrong. There should be so much more government money, other major farm foundation money, so that in this context, we've been forced to sort of argue about is there serotonin neurotoxicity in the absence of any evidence about benefits, and that's finally emerging. So I think you cannot look at the risk question without also looking at the benefits. And if I think you talk to somebody who's like Peter's person who did those drawing, drawings, if you say to her, if you remember one less word, you know, would you pay that price? <laughs> Thank you. Um, you've had your hand up, and then there's a gentleman at the back there. So, uh, yes, please. Okay, I want to make a two short remarks and one question. Uh, first, I want to congratulate Andy for coming. I think it's very uh, good that somebody with a different kind of discourse attend the conference because it's very easy to create. <laughs> I personally invited Andy and indeed all the panel because I have deep respect for all their work. So thank you for pointing that out. And uh, the other thing that I want to say is, as an anthropologist, I kind of find some resonance with this therapeutic discourse, this kind of exemption for therapeutic use. I find resonance with the religious argument for exemption. There seems to be sort of in the air some kind of ex exclusivism that in this context things are different. And I'd like to go again for Carlos' talk in the morning, that we look into wider perspectives, because as an anthropologist, I'm pretty afraid to take drugs with doctors, no? <laughs> That's a little provocation, but I respect a lot of the work of maps. And what, what, I'm, what I'm interested in, is what I find kind of this funny circuit system, is that uh, the whole proposal to study the, fish, the efficacy of drugs is to try to see what is their effect not counting expectations. So you kind of make all these techniques double and nobody knows what they're taking and all this kind of neutral context. But I find this paradoxical because we all know that taking drugs depends a lot on expectations. So isn't it important that we try to create this, this expectation that it will heal us? And how do you deal that in scientific terms? Because it's very important that we have a, if you want to create the therapeutic official use, you need a accompanying culture of belief in this cosmology, in this idea that it will heal us, because this is fundamental for healing. And I think this kind of conference gives a, a kind of setting for this, that it's creating this cultural uh, understanding for all of us, that we 
we, we have some, some sort of thing we can uh, relate to. And that, that doesn't appear in the discourse. Everybody's trying to detach all these uh, uh, cultural elements to it, but shouldn't we, we bring it into to stage and sort of, in, instead of get rid of it, try to uh, elaborate on it, build on it. There's a guy at the back who must have us be very sore with your arm in the air for so long, so please, let's have your question. <laughs> I, I was just worried about the interchangeable use of the words ecstasy and MDMA. Um, I know. Yeah. Um, if ecstasy can be a combination of many different substances, then how does the term polydrug use come into there? Uh, I mean, I think, I think we've covered that somewhat, that it, it's, it is very difficult to make uh, any reasonable comments about recreational ecstasy users and... Uh, combine that with what we know about MDMA. So, uh, do we need to say any more on that? What's um, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think we've we've already explored that. Can I just make a so, quick MDMA is being sold as well, and yep. that's adulterated. So, it's interchangeable. You just don't know because of the illegality. I think one of the hard things for research over the years since I've been doing this sort of stuff is that ecstasy's changed so much. There's been times when ecstasy was MDMA, um, and now it's rubbish. I mean, nobody's using it. Um, you know, but in, in, in history, it, it was good. There was good stuff around. And, and so if you're, look, if you're looking at the research over time, you think, well, if they were doing it 10 years ago, yeah, probably this is MDMA they're talking to. If they're doing it now, well, we've no idea. So that, again, creates a a very odd literature and evidence base, really. So that's why you know, we have to go with the studies that have been much more controlled and really checked what's in the pills and, uh, you know, and all the body fluids that show that. Yeah, I, I can agree. In the last two years in Swansea, we've had difficulty getting ecstasy users. So if you are an ecstasy user <laughs> and you're taking pure MDMA, then please come along to Swansea and we'll, we'll test you. OK. Uh, yes, uh, this lady down the front here. Um, in our internet survey, we simply asked people. In the study I talked about where we had the people go dancing under two drug conditions. But if you ask them that, if the area where they were dancing was safe for them, was there air conditioning, was there, was there water available? You know, so, do you know what I mean? So that their setting was optimum. Because it, it's all well and good to be able to conduct these studies in, in a laboratory where the temperature's nice and you have all these things available. <coughs> but what about in a recreational setting where it's unpredictable? We did a study in a nightclub and we did the ambient temperature of the dance floor and it was 25.9 degrees centigrade at about 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, we also found no temperature rise in any of the participants. Um, you know, so I think the thing is, is we do need to be careful that that club had yeah, air conditioning absolutely. and it was turned on. You know. You know, and I think that that's a very, very good point. And, and people need to take that into account when they're assessing these studies, particularly if it's so I think on the it internet. Also it's also educating the people that are going to take these substances as well. well. I just wanted to comment that the police have taken notice in the United States that some clubs will provide areas that are lower temperature than the main dance areas. And the police have used that as a reason to arrest the club owners and to try to take their property because it's a sign 
that they are aware that drug use is taking place in their facility. <laughs> so that there was a case in New Orleans where the DEA explicitly said that if there are rooms that are 15 degrees or more lower than the dance areas, that that is a sign that they can be prosecuted for having a club where MDMA is being used. So the American Civil Liberties Union finally was able to fight that. But what we have is a perverse situation where the police have a harm maximization strategy. <laughs> and that's what we have with impure drugs, with reducing harm reduction efforts, because they want to scare people from ever trying to do it. And that's the idea I think that worries me a little bit about this concern about suppressing research into the therapeutic use. It sort of fits into this overall strategy. We're only looking at risks. We can't have honest drug education for young people because if there's benefits, then what are we going to do? How do we explain that to them? And what do they then believe about the other studies? So I think we have a perverse situation that we have to somehow or other get around. And I think it's a BS question about expectancy. For our research, we really have one audience. And it's not everybody here. It's the regulatory agencies. We have to speak their language. And so we must work within their context. And eventually, maybe we can broaden out, or that'll be a bigger discussion. But for the next 10 years or so, we must speak directly to the concerns of the regulatory agencies. OK. Uh, this chap here, black t-shirt. Um, this is a different type of thing, but um, I'd just like to make the point that, having worked um, with survivors of sexual abuse, and seen very significant proportion of those um, don't respond to, to therapy. Um, and being a, a, a long-term survivor of uh, sexual abuse and um, those clients which don't recover, I think they think that the, the risk that they run on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis is self-harm and suicidal ideation. Um, they all think that the, the types of concerns that we discuss in the ministry I think that's a, a very good comment from someone with a clinical perspective on the risk-benefit um, argument. Okay. And if I could... Uh, uh, can I just... Uh, If I could re respond to your first question, um, if you're going to have a drug which severely depletes serotonin, which is the theory of the midweek blues, and you've got somebody with suicidal thoughts, then that's a potential danger. So they may well have very positive thoughts and good therapy with you on the session. The problem is what's going to happen in the recovery periods two or three days afterwards. So that's one potential issue which I think needs to be addressed. Okay, uh, let me just say that the FDA has recently noticed that you know, with certain kind of medications, there's a low risk, certain antidepressant medications, and also Chantix that's used for tobacco cessation, that there is a low risk of a very small minority of people either getting agitated, violent, or potential suicide. So now they have required all drugs that affect the central nervous system to include measures of suicidality. So we have included that now in all of our clinical studies, and we'll be able to really have clear, definite data about that risk. Yeah. Uh, Andy Roberts. Right, yeah. Uh, in my professional life, the past 22 years, I've worked uh, as a project worker or a manager in hospitals dealing with young, vulnerable, homeless people, usually aged between 16 and 25. I, I was working in hospitals, and I didn't mind working during the, the ecstasy period of between sort of 85, 86, and about 94. I saw hundreds of young people take ecstasy, people from tragic backgrounds who had no life whatsoever. And I saw it revolutionized their lives to the point where they were transformed people. 
And to me, we feel the baby out of the bathwater because the, the minuscule harms I've seen to young people working in, when I've worked in hospitals have been far, far, far outweighed by the positive experiences of those young people, many of whom have gone on to bright futures, transformed by their ecstasy experience. Okay, well, I think we're kind of, uh, Peter wants to make another point. Um, okay. I'd like to respond to Andy. If you give ecstasy, uh, MDMA, sorry. <laughs> MDMA to uh, uh, a subject who has sexual assault history and um, he gets depressed on Wednesday, it's not the same thing if, if he's in therapy or it's just recreational use you will have a better therapeutic alliance with them and it will call you up. And it, it will probably be not just a, a whims of his serotonergic system, but it will have to do with the material that came up in the session. And it's easier to deal with than just Wednesday blues. Um, I think we should uh, wind this up, mainly because otherwise it will not stop. Um, <laughs> I mean, for me, uh, I, firstly, I just want to thank all of our panel and all of you lot um, for really making my day. It's been a tremendous afternoon looking at all of these issues, and this has been the icing on the cake. It's is, uh, really good to get everyone together, yourselves and these guys here. Thank you very much. I mean, for me, we're talking about... Take this forward. Let's bear in mind that we have to look at MDMA versus ecstasy. We have to look at clinical versus recreational. And we have to look at risk versus benefits because otherwise we're going to get confused. Thank you all so much. Have a lovely evening.